Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving math problems, SAT math problems, out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we'll solve some problems that you will find on page number. 608. Turn to it please. Page 608. The very first problem, number 25, as you can see, is already on the blackboard. Let's take a look at it. If at the end of the video you decide that this was helpful and that you would like to work with me, you can get hold of me by sending me an email at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's take a look at it. So here we are given two years, 2000 and 2010. We are given the population 862 and 846, and we are also told the relationship is linear. The question simply is, if the relationship is indeed linear, what would the relationship look like? So here we have population as a function of time, and we just have to figure out what the slope is going to be and what the y-intercept is going to be because it's a really linear relationship. Y-intercept is very, very straightforward. This is where we start at. When t is equal to 0, because that's the starting point, when t is equal to 0, the population is going to be 622. The question is, what's the slope? Let's find out, shall we? As you can clearly see, we go from 862 to 846. 62 to 46, that's a 2, that becomes 5, that's a drop of 12, drop of 12 over 10 years. Over 10 years, 2000 to 2010, that's a drop 12 over 10 years, which is 1.2 per year. There you go, that is our slope, and it is a drop, it's a negative slope, it's going to be negative. 1.2 times t, t for the time period, and that is all there is, and that is not what I have in my book, that is wrong, 12 minus 6 is not 2, 12 minus 6 would be 6, that's a good thing that I have this in front of me, it minimizes the number of times I make a fool of myself in a given day, in a given 24 hour period. So there you go. Negative 1.6t uh, plus 862. And that answer choice would be actually the first one, answer choice A. Let's take a look at the next one, shall we? Question number 26 is already on the blackboard as well as you can see because I didn't want to take a time to I didn't want to take the time to write the whole thing. We are told that we're going to do a survey to determine the average number of children per household in our community. And they gave me the job, and being the bright person that I am, I went straight to the playground and I picked 20 people at uh, 20 families there and I asked them how many children they have. And I found out that uh, the mean I think they tell you something, I don't have everything here. They, I found out that the mean of these 20 people that are 20, 20 families that I surveyed was 2.4. The question simply is, what's going on here? What did I do wrong? So they give us four statements, and the question is, which of these four statements, which must be true? And this part is here is very important. A says that the true mean, true mean is 2.4. In other words, I took the sample of 20 families, but that is indeed the average number of children per household in my community. That is the true average. But that statement that we see here, that is something that may or may not be true. It is not something that is necessarily not true. That is not something that is definitely not true. It may be true, but we have no way of knowing it. All we can say is the average for our survey was 2.4. Next one goes on to say that the sample size, sample size is too small. Again, that may be true. That may be true. It may not be true. It may be quite enough sample size. Depends on the size of the community. You took 20 families. I have no idea how many families there are in the community. There might be only 200 families in the community or there might be 2,000 families. I have no way of knowing. So we cannot tell, say for sure that this is something that is not necessarily that is something this term, this statement is true. It may not be true. Not it may not be true. 
sample size is too small, the answer is not necessarily so. It may be, it may not be. Answer to my C is what we are interested in, it says it is. It says the sampling is flawed and therefore it's a biased bias estimate. What do you think? You think they should fire me from the wonderful for the wonderful job that I did of going to a playground to find out the average number of children? Of course it's a biased sample. Of course it's a biased sample. It's like going to uh, they gave me the just previous week they gave me another job and they told me they could go out in the community to do a survey to find out what's the average age of the people in our community. So I went straight to a nursing home and I asked a bunch of octogenarians how old they were and I, found, I proudly reported that the average age of uh, average of our citizen in our community is 86. So by a sample of course, it sample has to be random. Do you understand? It has to be random. You cannot, you cannot just go to uh, playground and ask. Obviously people who are going to go to playground, they all, you, you get the idea. It's like trying to determine What's the average con average consumption of alcohol in our in our community? And I go straight to the bar to serve to the survey. That's not going to work. And D is even worse. D simply says that. D simply says, and you can read the bloody thing yourself. It says everything is everything is hunky dory. If you read the answer choice D. No, no, not. Not bloody likely. It's a sampling method is not flawed. It is likely to produce unbiased estimate, the mean of the children in the household, and so on and so forth. The answer is C. It is a flawed sample, therefore, it's going to give you a biased estimate. You cannot go to playground to find out the average number of children. If you want to find out how many times an average family in your community goes to church in a given time period. You cannot go stand outside a church on Sunday morning to figure out to take a, start taking a random sample. That is not a random sample, that's a bias sample. It will produce the bias estimate. Number 27. Number 27 says that the point PR lies on this line right here. Y is equal to x plus b. They're going to, they're going to tell us that another point, a point with the coordinates 2p and 5r, lies on this line. 2x plus b. The question simply is, what is r over p? Let's find out, shall we? Well, if this point lies on this line, then the coordinates of this point must satisfy this equation. The y coordinate is r, and that must equal x plus b, x coordinate is p, p, p plus b. Solve this equation for b, and we get r minus b. Let's keep it there. Similarly, if this point with the coordinates 2p and 5r lies on this line, the coordinates of this point must satisfy this equation. So we have y, which is y coordinate, which is 5r must equal 2 times x which is 2p plus b. The solve for b. So here we get b is equal to 5r minus 4, 4b. Four Don't forget the 4. 2 and 2, 4. Let's equate the two together and do our thing. So r minus p must equal r minus p must equal this, this quantity 5r minus 4p. We need r over p, so bring the r on one side, p on the other side, you get the idea. So if you bring this r to that side, you're going to get 4r. And bring the negative 4p here, you're going to get positive 4p and a negative p, you're going to get negative 3p. And r over p, it looks like it's 3 quarter. There you go. The answer is 3 quarter, whatever the answer happens to be. This answer to is b. Let's do the next one, shall we? Number 28. Number 28. I hope that you are working on your vocabulary skill also, that comes in handy on the reading part as I always remind you, work on your vocabulary. Watch those videos, there are 100 videos. Have a discipline and have a routine, have a regimen and learn a few new words every day. These are all 
words that appear very frequently on the SAT. Number 28. 28, we have 22 students. They recorded their pulse before and after. Before and after doing some exercise. Let's see what we have here. So I'm going to do my best that, we, that I can do here. I don't know if I need to put all of this thing, but I'm going to do it anyway just for the hell of it. So it goes 56, 60, 64, 68, 72, 76, 80, and all the way up to 84 and 88. And there are 22 students, so we should have 20, 22 observations. We have 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It really doesn't matter. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We have 5 here. 2, 3, 4, 5. And we have 7 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. As I said, if I miss something, it, 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 it doesn't matter. You'll see in a second. Here's the second one. We start with 80. Of course, start with 80. The pulse rate is much higher because you have just finished doing the exercises. And it goes all the way up to 112 again in increments of 4. So 84, 88, 92, 96, 100, 104, 108, and 112. Here we have 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 3, 2, and 2. You'll see in a second that all of this is actually too much work, we really don't need it. Essentially, if we look at the answer choices, they want us to compare the range and the standard deviation. So let's start with the easier part first, which is, this, which is the range. The range for this guy is very, very simple. The range is this one. Let's call it the range. This is the, this is the, this is the before and this is the after. So the range for before, before the exercise, would be 88, which is the highest observation we see here, and 56, which is the lowest observation we get 32. Range for after, the highest observation we get see is 112, the lowest is 80, and what we find is that the ranges are the same. The range for both of both set of observations, before and after, is the same. Immediately we can cross out uh, anything that says the ranges are not the same. We can cross out B and C. B and C both claim that the two ranges are not the same. The next thing we have to do is compare the standard deviation. That is also very straightforward. We don't have to do any calculation at all. There is no nitty-gritty calculation required. They are simply trying to see if you understand the concept of standard deviation. What does the standard deviation measure? What does it tell us? It tells us the spread of observation. It tells us the spread of observation around the mean. And you can clearly see here as clearly see here, this, this observation is actually very evenly They are all clustered around the mean. This is going to be the mean here. They are all clustered around the mean. And therefore, the standard deviation of this guy, and here they are all spread out. It's going to have a very large standard deviation because they are all spread out. And therefore, the standard deviation of before, this is the before picture, is going to be less than the standard deviation of after. But it turns out that when I looked at the answer choices, I realized that we didn't even have to do that much work. We simply have to understand that the two standard deviations are not equal. And that you can clearly see just by looking at it. This is more widespread. Two standard deviations are not equal, and that is answer choice. Because answer choice A claims that they are, that they are equal. The answer is D. The answer is D. Let's look at the next one, number 29. Give me one second. I'm getting greedy because if I wait too long, the tea gets too cold. And that is no bloody good. Number 29. Let's see what 29 has to say. Oh, 29 has to do with some photocopier. We are told that we just loaded We 
we just loaded the copier with uh, 5,000 sheets and we are told this is the important part yeah, this is very important information that the copier is, uh, is depleting the number of pages in the machine at a constant rate this, the machine is on constantly and is depleting therefore the pages that are left in the tray at a constant pace we are further told that after 20 minutes we have used up 30% of paper. What does it tell us? If we have used up 30% of the papers in 20 minutes, divide top and bottom by divide top and bottom by 10, and what we find is that we are using up one and a half percent, three over two is one and a half percent per minute. This is how fast it's depleting. There you go, we are done. That's our slope. That tells us how fast it's depleting, and it is depleting, so it's going to have a negative slope, obviously. And what is the intercept? What's the y-intercept? That's the number of pages you're going to show in the equation when t is zero. When, when t is zero, when you start in a job, it starts with 5,000. So the number of pages, which is a function of minutes here, is going to be 5,000 that we start with minus 3.5%. Now we have to write this into fraction part. Let's do it on the side here if you like. Three and a half percent. What does the word percent mean? Percent means per 100. Five percent means five over 100. Seven percent means seven over 100. One and a half percent would mean one and a half over 100. One over one and a half is three halves over 100, which is simply three over 200. Three over 200 is depleting at this rate. Three, one and a half percent of what? One and a half percent of 5,000. One and a half of 5,000. This is how fast it's depleting, and this is the number of minutes. So if this is 10, it's going to be 10 times this amount. If it's 20, you get the idea. We just have to very simplify it, and we are done. Let's do it, shall we? Let's divide top and bottom by 100. If you divide top and bottom by 100, the two zeros are going to go away. Let's divide top and bottom by 2. This is 2 goes to go away, and this 50 is going to become 25, and we're left with 25 times 3. And that gives us 5000 minus 75 M. This is what we're looking for. This is the relationship. And let's see which one that matches that. That's answer choice B. I look at the answer choices in a hurry. Sometimes if I give you the wrong letter at the end, there's no need to freak out. So there's absolutely no, no reason at all at that point to get your knicker in the twist, you understand? Number 30. We are told that the maximum value of F is K. And the question is, what's the G of K? And they give us here, they give us here the value of the function G on the side here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, it goes 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So before we can figure out what the value of the function g, uh, g of k is, we have to first find out what k is equal to. And for that, they give us a, they give us a picture, a graph for function f, as you can see in, your, in front of it, in, your, in, your, in front of you, in the book. And it looks something like this. Here is the maximum value for f of x. This is your f of x. And if you look at the graph carefully, the maximum value of f is 3, which is our k. There we go. Therefore, we're looking for g of 3. k is equal to 3. We're looking for g of 3. g of 3 is going to be right here. Oh, I don't know why I made a, such a mess about it. Thank you. This is your g of 3. It equals 6. The answer is 6. And that is answer choice. B. We're going to stop right here. We're going to meet again tomorrow, obviously, and we're going to continue with the gradient questions that you see on the following page. All right. In the meantime, as I said before in the beginning of the video, if you wish to get hold of me, if you wish to talk to me about anything at all, you can always get hold of me by simply sending me an email 
at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. See you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.